I know. I had to. And I, I hate it. <laughs> I was here this morning and I was so hot. I <laughs> So I'm taking off. So. So All right, it was so cold. Yeah, I think we're, we're ready to start. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yes. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this panel on Teaching as Liberating Practice. Uh, I'm Malka Simon from the Roberta S. Matthews Center for Teaching and Learning, and we are honored to co-sponsor this afternoon's session together with the School of Education and the Wolf Institute. Um, I'm very excited to be here in conversation with my wonderful colleagues and the esteemed Barbara Smith. Um, and I want to give a special thank you to Gaston and all the Wolf Institute staff who have worked so hard to bring us this incredible week of programming. So thank you uh, again to them. Um, and just as we begin, I want to remind everyone to please remain masked for the remainder of this session. Um, so since Gaston asked me to introduce today's event, I've been reflecting on this phrase of teaching as liberating practice. And what does it mean, particularly in the context of the work of Barbara Smith? Our panelists today will discuss their interpretations of this concept. And I thought I would get the ball rolling with some reflections from my own experience. So when I think of teaching's potential for liberation, I first think uh, of my time spent as an undergraduate right here at Brooklyn College. And I don't remember my professors talking about liberation in any explicit way, but I found the classroom incredibly freeing when I was here. Coming from a pretty insular background, I was thrilled to encounter new ideas from across disciplines. And it was really electrifying to learn them in a new community, um, with people and classmates from so many different places in diverse, as we know, only Brooklyn College can be. Uh, the whole experience was liberating and it broke down my preconceived assumptions, introducing me to ways of learning and thinking and fields of study that I barely knew existed until I came here. When I came back to campus, it was on the other side of the classroom. Uh, much to my surprise, um, and I was trained in art history. So unlike my colleagues in the School of Ed, I never was taught how to teach. <laughs> sort of threw me in. Um, and I, it was something that I learned through tri trial and a lot of error. And over the years, uh, I've really expanded what I teach and how I teach it. And that process, while it's often been challenging, um, has also been deeply liberating to me. Teaching has really freed me to explore new ideas with my students, pushing me outside what's comfortable and what's familiar as we voice our opinions. And as I make more space for the voices of my students, I'm happy to find myself learning from them, shifting my own work in response to what they've taught me. That's been truly rewarding. Um, when I first came to the classroom, I thought I knew what a teacher was, right? I think we all have this idea of what a teacher is. It was an all-knowing guide who could show her students the right way uh, to see things. And I think about it now, and I think there was a real fear and a real smallness in that conception. So, like, I was always afraid, what if I didn't know something? Or what if I couldn't answer a question? Or what if I lost control? Like, I had to control my classroom, my classroom, right? Um, but as I've let go of that image, I realize that teaching, which is to say a conversation and exchange with my students, has liberated me from that fear and the <coughs> pressure to conform to a role and to always have the answer. Our guest of honor this week, Barbara Smith, has been described as many things, and I was thinking about this panel, and I thought in the context of this panel, one word in particular stands out to me, and that is activist. 
As academics, we can get very easily trapped in the ivory tower, even here. <laughs> and uh, we really get absorbed, I think, in the lofty ideas of teaching and in theory, but also the mundane, you know, time to make a PowerPoint for class, um, you know, time to send an email. And I think also even when we try to do things right, when, you know, we're thinking about teaching, it's so easy to lose the forest and our focus on the trees as we worry about how to expand our pedagogy. What trick should I try today for student engagement? What should I, you know, what should I, what should I take for a spin? Um, I wonder a lot, am I doing enough? Maybe I should be engaged in something that's more impactful. But I think that ultimately there's really no better place for activism than in the classroom because this is to me where the rubber meets the road, where we have real conversations happening in our classroom. Um, they're engaging, they are exciting, they are difficult, they are fun a lot of times, <laughs> a lot of fun. Um, and I think that teaching really liberates theory from the ivory tower and it brings ideas alive and it allows us to share our passion with our students while they show us what matters to them. And at its best, the classroom then becomes a space for meaningful liberation. I'm very happy to say that I'm not the same person I was when I first set foot on this campus. So just to answer your question, I think it was 27 years ago. <laughs> but um, I've been privileged to learn and to collaborate with my teachers, with my peers, and of course with my students. Um, and having said that, I'm also very excited, and especially since I've started at the Center for Teaching and Learning, I'm so excited to learn more from today's panelists, my wonderful and thoughtful and so such generous colleagues that have so graciously been working with me over the past few months on other things, other teaching-related things. So uh, having said all of that, I'm going to turn the floor over now to Sonia Murrow, and thank you all. Well, everyone, I'm Sonia Morrow. I'm a professor in the School of Education. My field is history education. Um, and I'm uh, very pleased to be here today. Um, I want to start out by, again, um, really giving special thanks to um, uh, Gaston Alonzo for his skillful and always compassionate um, and very kind facilitation of this week's programming. Um, the title of our session today is Teaching as Liberating Practice. Liberation pedagogy is anti-oppressive. It acknowledges uh, the support and the effort to liberate minds and lives. Liberation pedagogy treats students as co-creators of knowledge. By centering student voice and choice, students are liberated to lead their learning, and to make meaningful connections to the world. Liberation pedagogy helps develop a critical consciousness in which students are empowered to identify, question, and solve relevant problems in society rather than passively absorb information for no other reason than to be tested. At the heart of this approach is valuing students' culture, students' experience, and their communities. Teaching and learning has the potential to liberate minds and lives, which is what draws our students to our programs in the School of Education at Brooklyn College. It's an honor to be able to serve as the moderator to this esteemed panel. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone um, at the request of today's speaker that we kindly wear our masks during the length of today's event. Next, I will read a land acknowledgement. As Brooklyn College sits on unceded territory stolen from the Canarsie and the Nyack, subgroups of the indigenous Lenape people in a neighborhood today officially designated as Little Haiti. The original ongoing theft along with the stolen blood and work of enslaved Africans facilitates our presence here. We pay our respects to all elders past, present, and future, including the enslaved, migrants, and immigrants who have stewarded this land. We know that this acknowledgement is neither sufficient nor complete, but is part of a process of learning to become more thoughtful and respectful. 
This process would include a deeper incorporation of indigenous and Native American cultures, philosophies, and peoples into the curriculum, faculty, student body, and staff of Brooklyn College, in line with our mission to provide a transformative, distinctive education to the whole people of New York City. This afternoon, we have four panelists, and we will begin with Barbara Smith. Um, then we will continue with the three other speakers. I will introduce each speaker um, as their time comes to speak. And I'm going to refer you to the program. Um, I'm not going to give extensive um, introductions for each presenter. I'm going to invite you to read uh, the program yourself. And so, um, uh, and, and then, of course, at the end of the four presenters, we will open up the floor for your comments and your questions. And we hope to have a, a rich and fulsome discussion. Um, and so, Barbara, we welcome you. Would you like to come up here? I will. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Malka and Sonia. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, we're getting to know each other <laughs> because um, I can't remember which event this is. The sixth one, I can't quite remember. But be that as it may, uh, it's really nice to see all of you. And I wanted to just um, tell you why I wanted to have this discussion. I will be learning as much from uh, hearing my colleagues on the panel as you uh, sitting out there uh, because uh, I don't have any particular expertise to share with you about teaching as a liberating practice except what I have done in my career myself. I feel like uh, that people, because I've worn a lot of different hats in my life, I feel like there's certain aspects of uh, work that I've been involved in and committed to that people may not be as familiar with. And there's only one thing that I've ever done that I was actually uh, trained for or uh, logically expected to do, and that was teaching. And a lot of people don't know <coughs> that. Uh, when I was a member of our Albany City Council, which is called the Common Council, a lot of people never knew that I had that as my profession. A lot of people who know me as an organizer or as an activist, they don't know that that's the only thing I should be allowed to do. <laughs> um, and uh, when, you know, when people read things that I write, they might think that, well, a lot of teachers, of course, and professors do write. But as I said, there's only one thing that I was professionally trained for. But like uh, Malka, I never took a single education course because when I went to graduate school, I went to graduate school in what was called English. Uh, there's a recent article in the New Yorker about how, uh, and this is about humanities as well as English, other humanities uh, 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 subjects, but the article is about what is happening with English. Is anybody studying it anymore? Is it going to go the way you know, of the dodo or the dinosaurs? Uh, but as I said, I was taking English because my objective, my clear objective as a senior in college, going to graduate school the same year that I graduated from college, was to teach African American literature, a subject I had never taken a course in because African American studies did not exist in those days. At the historically black colleges and universities, black literature was often taught but it was taught in the context of an American literature class, <coughs> or a class on poetry, or a class on the novel, or whatever. It was not necessarily a separate course of nothing uh, but African American and black uh, writers. So I went to graduate school to teach the top, uh, subject I had never been trained in, and in all my years of grad school, I did not write a dissertation. I wrote one chapter of a dissertation, but my mistake was I was already getting published. Uh, by that time, and since my uh, real desire was to be a writer, <laughs> I don't know if it was a mistake or not, but I did all, did all the coursework uh, for a PhD, 
So in both the master's, you know, for my master's degree and for my uh, doctoral work, I, ne I had one course in African-American literature, one. So I read all the British uh, uh, major, so-called major white male writers, and I read all the American white male writers. I took one course in women's literature in the fall of 1971 at the University of Connecticut, and it was one of the first courses in women's literature, literature ever taught in the United States. And like the title of a book you may have heard, all the women were white. I did my uh, seminar paper on black women writers, and I told my uh, professor that's what I wanted to do. She had no suggestions for me as to who I might look at. I had already written uh, a uh, senior thesis on four African-American writers, all male. So you can see that I was searching, searching for something, searching for subject matter that did not exist. I now want to shift in my remaining minutes to kind of my philosophy of teaching. Uh, I just said earlier today that basically, as far as teaching was concerned, because as I said, I never had an education course, as far as teaching was concerned, in my mind is that all I need to do is the opposite of everything that was ever done uh, in front of me in the name of teaching. I had some wonderful teachers at Mount Holyoke where I went to college, uh, memorable teachers, some who I stayed in contact with throughout their lives. Uh, sadly now, uh, my favorite teacher has been deceased for some years. He was fairly young, uh, too. Uh, but be that as it may, um, I had teachers who did not think I should be in the college I was in because I was in that desegregation generation of African American and black and other students of color. And uh, we actually got the clear message uh, that they that there were professors who did not think we'd be long <coughs> in school, we were taking the slot or something. Did deserve to be at the school, namely a white woman. It is a women's college. Uh, that uh, thing of like pouring into a student uh, chalk and talk, all of those kinds of things that people talk about in relationship to common teaching methodology, but not necessarily the best. Um, I wasn't subjected to that because I wasn't really trained to how do you do this. But I, one of the things in the classroom, I did not want my students to be intimidated. Um, I did not want them to feel stupid. Um, I was not there to do gotchas around the subject matter. I loved the subject matter. It was clearly, from what I just said, it was subject matter that I pursued, even though it was not institutionally supported. So I wanted them, if they didn't get anything else, else out of my class, I wanted them to at least understand why I loved the subject matter so much. And I knew that that would not happen if I made them feel bad, bad about not understanding things that we were reading because they had never lived the experience of the authors that uh, was being described and that we, were, that we were reading. In other words, I know that some teachers that I've heard about, professors, uh, and I've always taught on the college uh, level, um, that some, particularly when we're dealing with uh, courses that are about marginalized groups, that <coughs> they think that it is uh, okay uh, to embarrass students, uh, to criticize students, when they make an error or uh, show a lack of understanding about uh, uh, culture and content that, as I said, they have a uh, little way of knowing about unless they're taught about it. Uh, I'll say a few words about tomor that tomorrow in my talk, but I always thought they're not going to get this and they're not going to love this if I make them feel bad because they're not me. You know? So we're going to go through this together. My early teaching experiences with my first classes in African American literature and particularly in black women writers were some of the most wonderful experiences I ever had in my life. There was so much joy in us discovering the work together. Another thing that I did, and remember, there was not really institutionalized African American studies at that time, but one of the things I also did, besides uh, wanting my students to feel empowered in uh, our classes uh, is, was to introduce them to other aspects of African-American <coughs> African 
agriculture and history. So um, we would look at uh, slides. That was the technology at the time. We'd look at slides of, of African-American artists. Uh, I would bring in music. We might listen to music, and I knew someone who actually played blues guitar, a real-life person. I was teaching at Emerson College in Boston, and I would bring him in, and we would listen to Blind Lemon Jefferson and Lead Belly. <laughs> and all those people is like, and if you really want to get deep into black literature, you really do need to deal with this. You really do, because that's really uh, the ground uh, work. Uh, one last thing I'll say about my philosophy is that I always taught at predominantly white institutions. The level of diversity that you have here and the level of inclusion that you have here at Brooklyn College, I never experienced in any place that I taught. But my perspective was that I was in the classroom for every student in the class. So I wasn't about creating armed camps between the students of color and the white students. I didn't, again, I didn't think that was going to serve the subject matter or eventually serve me or them. Um, I had to demonstrate, and this was really hard for somebody who was in their mid-20s at the time and who had never taught before. I felt the need to demonstrate to my students, I'm here for every single one of you, no matter who you are. You can come to me, you can talk to me, I respect you, I, I need and want you to respect me, but we're not going to do like this warfare thing because there's something called white supremacy and racism in the United States. It was a enter, an interesting balancing act, one that I still negotiate on a daily basis, and even though I'm not professionally employed any longer as a teacher and have not been for some years, since the early 2000s, I feel that I teach every day. And as I said, that's what I was trained for. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Barbara. And now I'm very glad to introduce uh, Professor Lawrence Johnson from the Department of Sociology. Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, I guess, what, I'm 43 years old now, so I guess I get more reflective um, <laughs> after the age of 40. I think about things more, and ever since I was invited to join this panel, I've just been thinking about all the ways in which um, I became the type of professor I am. And I actually think about a few different things I want to share, but one of the last conversations I had with my um, aunt, who was like my grandmother because my mother is the youngest of 11, but she was like super proud of me being a professor. Although she didn't know much about <clears throat> what my life as a professor entailed, but she said something which I took as a joke at the time. But the more and more I think about it, it was really profound. She said, um, she, she, was, she said, I'm proud of you. And I said, thanks, I think I know. She was like, you don't know. <laughs> I'm proud of you because I put you there. And I was like, what? And she was like, we raised hell at Eisenhower High School. You know, and I thought about it, but I've been surrounded by people my whole life who started black studies. And there's one thing that was taken as a given. You go to school to demand things that your education is supposed to provide. And black studies is supposed to transform the institution, which is funny because um, I would have never thought coming from Virginia Tech, where um, the student enrollment of black students was like 2%, and then come to Brooklyn College. And back up real quick. The first time I had a black teacher at any level black male teacher at any level was in graduate school. So now as a black professor, even coming to Brooklyn College, I'm stunned that I might be the only black male in the classroom. In the college, they claim to be so diverse, right? So that like startles me almost every time I see it, and I'm gonna get used to it. 
but I think most of us have gotten used to it. So, um, actually, I actually had notes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I had a formal education, informal education that, in, that involved black studies. I'm a trained sociologist, but my education has been black studies. Um, another example, my next door neighbor, I asked her, have you seen Judas and the Black Messiah, a movie that came out a couple years ago that depicts the Black Panthers, Fred Hampton, Chicago. And she was like, I don't need to watch it. <laughs> and almost like my aunt, I was like, why not? She was like, because I'm not in it. And I thought, like, what? <laughs> and she's like, I'm not in it. These movies often depict, you know, the end of a story when someone dies. But I'm still here, right? So the point I'm getting at is that there's a struggle that started long before even the formal implementation of black studies. But Brooklyn College does a good job of celebrating diversity without telling stories. And almost everything is rooted in stories and the ones that we're allowed to tell. I want to tell another story because this is the one I shared last week at the People's Hearing about racism and repression at CUNY. I had a student, a black male student, circa 2017, and this is really this really had me thinking and what really propelled my thinking about pedagogy and liberation because I was finishing a bike ride about 60, 70 miles and I was like so close to home that I didn't want to get on a train but I was depleted and I was just looking and I'm seeing the Saratoga stop three lines realizing I'm in Brownsville and I'm just thinking like I could ride two more miles and get home as I'm contemplating Somebody walks up on me and is like, yo, yo, and my instincts kick in, and I'm like, you know, get back. I don't, I don't do that. And then I realized that this person like Professor Johnson. <laughs> so um, I obviously knew, I knew I knew the person, and it was a student that I had around 2017. I mean, um, before, a couple semesters before. Um, that student wasn't particularly memorable. In fact, the only thing I did know was that he was one of the few black males that I had in class that um, He never talked. He did his work. And then semester was over, he was gone. Um, but that day, he told me, he glad he bumped into me because he was having a conversation and something I said in class that time actually made him think of me. He wasn't having a conversation with other people in school come to find out he didn't finish school but he was having a conversation about reparations in Brownsville with other people that looked like him and that was a more comfortable place for him to have that conversation I asked him why didn't he finish and he was just like it's one of those I think I know but I don't know how to articulate that type of answer so I was like why didn't you finish why don't you come back and he was just like man Brooklyn College and he just kind of shrugged it off right so I've been thinking about that since like 2017. It's like, what are the barriers between what we idealize as liberatory practice as professors and what are we up against? We talked for an hour that day about reparations that went somewhere else. And he actually remembered something I had in, I said, I said, I said in class. And he actually said, I thought about you. But what was the barrier? And how much do we have to overcome as faculty members in institutions where certain students don't feel welcome, right? I went to Iowa State. <laughs> we had an acronym that Iowa stands for Institute of White America. <laughs> <laughs> and we brought, we brought speakers all the time. And depending on the speaker, it would be standing room only. Thousands of people, mostly students. And one of the things that we've been trying to figure out in the sociology department, we got faculty in sociology who spend great time, energy, and effort to try to make Brooklyn College a place where students understand you don't come here just to take classes to leave. We, we talked about in our sociology liberation project of how do we turn our department into a community. And one thing that students are very consistent about, Brooklyn College does not make it that way for us. I asked students yesterday, are you coming to the talk tomorrow? Why would we come to the top where our professor don't give us time to actually go, right? 
we have a great renowned speaker guest for the week, but we treat it like another thing that students have to compete with. And the biggest value resource that students have is time, which they have very little of. And oftentimes we try to get more from them and then they try to get more from faculty, do more with less. And it keeps reminding me, what is the obstacle between me and the student? What makes it so difficult to engage them on subjects that I know they're interested in, but they have to get to work, right? They have to get to their other four or five classes or they lose their scholarship. These are the things that when we talk about liberatory practice, there's plenty of great faculty here who think about liberation more than the students. The students are thinking about how to survive. How do we teach students whose number one priority and not being hyperbolic at all is to survive. In New York, where they got work, family, school, all these different things. We're working on a study right now where the number one thing that students are talking about that they need, the top priority is not school. It's often money, then family, their mental health. How does one improve their mental health at Brooklyn College mm. while pursuing things that they're interested in and actually feeling a value for education? So I could go on and on, but one of the best teaching moments at Brooklyn College was when a group of students in my theory course demanded to speak to the provost, to the dean, and asked, why in the hell are we in the biggest Caribbean diaspora in the world? You're making us choose between four great candidates in a Caribbean studies program that is underfunded. And, of course, the provost came and the students got gaslit and they understood it right away. And I had to spend the rest of the semester talking about college politics <laughs> and how they don't matter in the long run. That's the obstacle. The student I talked to in Brownsville that day, he understood it. I think most students understand it, which is why this room is not packed. So um, that's my thoughts on liberation sociology. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Mm -hmm. um, next, our next speaker is Cherry Lou Sai. Um, professor of English and Asian American Studies at Brooklyn College. going to be showing that in a bit. Um, Lawrence, oh my God, that was... <laughs> oh my God. I was getting uh, re-triggered as you were talking, actually. Um, yeah, normally I don't have anything when I'm asked to speak at things. I don't have like a speech prepared, but I figured I should because the last time I did this, which is last year, I was crying buckets in, in, on stage with the students. And so I said, not again. Okay, so this time I wrote I wrote something. Um, but before I go on, I just want to, uh, something that I learned from a lot of indigenous people that I had met and encountered in the last several years is that they introduce themselves, you know, because in our society today, we do not take the time to introduce ourselves. There is an, always an agenda and it has to be done quickly because that is how we are, um, raised in this very, very corporate world. So I will say my name is Cherry Lusai. I am a playwright, sorry, phone. I'm a playwright and a fiction writer. Although now a naturalized citizen of this nation, I still consider myself an immigrant to the Philippines of Chinese and Filipino heritage. Currently, I am an adjunct lecturer in the English and American Studies Department. We do not have an Asian American Studies Department, like um, the underfunding, there is no funding for Asian American Studies Department, not even Although, from what I understand, there is a minor kind of coming, but I may not be here when that happens. Anyway, um, but on top of that, I am also an alum of the MA English and MFA Playwriting Programs at Brooklyn College. So I was once a student, like a lot of you here. 
Um, but on top of that, and sometimes I am embarrassed to admit this, I am a college assistant at the scholarship office, a position that I have yet to relinquish since my grad school days. As you can see, I wear many hats in this school out of necessity. So the first thing I'm going to do, actually, um, I had encountered this video recently, and I just I want everybody to see this. Okay? And I'll explain the context later. Oh, good God. Oh, God. Oh. This film, otherwise known, sorry, um, YouTube is doing its thing. Um, <laughs> This film, otherwise known as film number 1274, was commissioned by the French government to be shown at the 1900 Paris Exposition. It was shot by Gabriel Ver sometime between April 1899 and March 1900 in the country that was known as French Indochina in the Annam Protectorate. Um, we now know this country as Vietnam. Uh, in this short clip, we see two a white French woman, the wife and daughter of Governor General Paul Dunyan, throwing coins in front of children. When I first saw this film last year, um, I had a visceral reaction. I mean, we, we heard Barbara having a visceral reaction too. I, I was actually, um, I can't tell you just how visceral my reaction was. Even now when I see it, I it's there. Um, it was like watching women throw food at pigeons, something I see all the time in New York City. There's a story here that I was experiencing. It wasn't just anonymous children these women were throwing coins at. These children look like people I know. Shoot, I'm going to cry again. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm trying not to. Um, these children look like people I know. They look like versions of my father, my grandmother, my mother, my family, my friends. I was also looking at these children like I was looking at myself, it became personal. The coins are being thrown at me. I am the one picking up the coins. Um, I had what the black thinker W.E.B. Du Bois called the double consciousness that I was both myself and not myself. I saw myself as myself, but also how others under the lens of colonialism and white supremacy view people like me an object or a recipient of pity at best because people seem to not be able to tell the difference between a truth and a lie. And what is the difference? I don't know. Um, is the truth objective? Is the truth printed in books? Academics would usually say yes, but to me as an artist, as a writer, I've come to discover that truth is plastic. In other words, it is also known to me as fiction. When it is written in books, it is truth. When it is not, it is a fabrication unverified gossip, a lie, a fiction. Traditionally, this is what I learned in school. Then what society at large taught me was that if it wasn't mainstream, it cannot possibly be true. In her eponymous essay, Poetry is Not a Luxury, the great Audre Lorde espouses the power of imagination through heart and poetry. And I take poetry to mean the art of the soul through the act of creation. She writes, our power lies in dreams, in our dreams, and it is our dreams that point the way to freedom. They are made realizable through our poems that give us strength and courage to see, to feel, to speak, and to dare. And to me, as an immigrant who learned to dream and to nightmare in the American way of life, I will use these words, fabrication, fabulation, and fiction. I also realize that not all poems liberate um, but instead give me pause because they are from what Audre Lorde called the European fathers. That is what the British writer Rudyard Kipling did to me while I read his poem, The White Man's Burden. Mm. 
published in 1899 when he was trying to convince the American government to take up the white man's burden of annexing and colonizing their little known brown brothers in the Philippines for good, the good of mankind. Kipling described Filipinos as half devil and half child, in quote. Filipinos, according to Kipling and those who agreed with him, are their sullen charges, and it is the American prerogative as it is as its civilizing mission to rule over them. In the ensuing years of 1899 to 1905, an estimated 1.4 million Filipinos, fresh from Spanish subjugation of three centuries, died during the Spanish-American War by American hands. I know what education did for me. It opened me to worlds and dimensions and gave me tools to view the history of this world, which is one of struggle towards power and control. But it also gave me the language to be able to say fabrication, fabulation, and fiction. And those who understand how these can become truths wield control over our destiny. This is the power of imagination. In closing, I would like to direct your attention to this film that one of my former students made. I'm so proud of uh, Annie Ho, um, who would have been here today, but they had to uh, work. She, they found a job. So um, I met Annie Ho in a class that I designed and taught called Introduction to the Asian American Pacific Islander Experience Literature. In a Google form, I asked what made students take the class. In their response, Annie mentioned that they were about to graduate from Brooklyn College, but this was the first time they saw a class like this offered in this institution, so they took it. During our first meeting, I asked everyone to bring an object that represents Asia or Asian American. Annie brought in a mirror, an heirloom from their grandmother. Later, they wrote a poem about it, and even much later, they made this film. Bring in something that represents to you. There is miniature fold of America that I have in my possession. It's got this beautiful fabric on the outside. One of those fabrics you'd see on a strong song. Deep royal blue with pink cherry blossoms on it. And when you open it, two mirrors, one of them cracked. Now, I grew up in a spiritual household. My grandma used to climb mountains to help others with proper guanyin burial procedures. The traditions and stories just ended up staying in the family. I was always told at a young age never to look into a cracked mirror because that was a sign of bad luck. So I don't even know why I kept it. It got me thinking. Maybe it was a symbol. Maybe it wasn't just this dumb little trinket that I kept as a result of my having inherited mom's hoarding problem. Perhaps I kept it as a souvenir because of how I resonated with it, with the message that it tells. A femme presenting Asian individual with the constant need to figure myself out, to find out who I am, whoever that might be. I'm always either too Asian or too American for someone, and I'm too invested to figure out why I even care so much. So, I'm constantly torn. Torn between wanting someone else to tell me who I am and the constant urge to look with it. Nine bullets punctured the nine bodies in Atlanta until six hit too close to home. Forced to look within, I dragged myself together, whatever pieces I had left. Picked up that miniature foldable mirror with the beautiful deep royal blue from sun fabric and pink cherry blossoms, and met my answer in my cracked and beautifully flawed reflection on the other side. I am a multifaceted being with more to offer than what was set in precedent for me. I am Asian America.
Thank you so much, Sherry Lou. Um, our next and final speaker is Laura Asenzi Marino. She's a professor of bilingual education and the bilingual program coordinator in the School of Education. Wow, I, I, that was incredible. That was absolutely incredible. Um, thank you all. It was, it's incredible to hear about how everybody's story is woven into their uh, theories of education and how it's related to liberating practice. Today, I'm going to take up all of those stories because I really believe in the power of stories and how really texts, our, our lives are our texts. In the School of Education, um, I think I teach literacy. So I think about literacy within the lives of people all the time. I wrote something that I'm going to read, and I hope that's okay. Um, my life as a literate person began on day one, nourished by the stories of my mother's childhood, growing up in El Altiplano de Colombia. My mother's stories of playing near the river, making figures out of greda, soft clay, or campesinos, wrapping food in hojas de plátano, they would put the food in hojas de plátano, and because it's cold, they would wear these garments called ruanas that are like and cover it so that they could get home with hot food for their family. What, that was my literacy. Those were my stories. I had very few books. And they stood in contrast to my life in Queens, where I grew up. But they were as real to me as the seven train and my walks past the fruit stores and the parlors on my way to school. These are the stories that formed me as a person and taught me that literacy can take many forms as it is deeply connected to language, experience, identity. I was also made aware very quickly that speaking another language was not valued by so many, especially if the person was a person of color. My mother and I looked very different. And um, as a college student, I was very drawn to Charity Moraga, who is uh, who came here several years ago, actually, before the pandemic. It was very emotional. Her, she speaks of her experience as a biracial person. Um, when I traveled with my mom, um, people often confused her as my babysitter uh, or made assumptions about her because of her language or her accent. And because as a child, I really believe that for children, identity is melded into your parents. So I didn't have a separate identity from my mom. And so all these, um, I don't even know what to call these, these kind of ways of seeing my mom were deeply felt by myself. Um, these experiences made me intimately aware that the ways that language and identity are intertwined exist within a complex ecology of factors. And it was not until I was older where I developed my own identity that was separate from my family. And so, as a child, my identity was merged with my mother. So I experienced in some ways how her experience as an immigrant, an undocumented immigrant, a Latina woman, and a speaker of Spanish existed in the world. I also learned that through that, that my identity is not an individual one. So often we think of our, we're raising children to be individuals, but not always so. My identity is not an individual one, but always in relation to others. I'm thinking about your aunt who is like, thank me, because I <laughs> you know? Uh, in other words, it's connected to my immediate and extended family and my larger communities. Well, one of the most important ways that my mom formed my literacy is through the stories she told me and the phrases she used. And almost all of the stories I heard as a child were about strength. She was really cultivating to be someone who could navigate challenges because that was her life. And she knew that what she could arm me best with was the strength to consistently confront these challenges. So one of the stories that I heard over and over was about my grandmother. My grandmother and grandfather lived on a farm with my mom and my aunt. Um, and they... Uh, they did lentils, papas, all these things. 
But once there were um, some workers who said, we think that there's the devil in the field. And what my grandmother did was she got on her horse and she rode to that place where they said the devil was. And she looked around and she investigated. And that was kind of the end of the story. They found scratches, they found all the stuff. But the story, what was at the heart of the story was instead of running in the opposite direction, she ran in the direction of fear, of danger, to investigate. Um, along with these stories, I always heard teachers, like my, one that my mom always continues to say to me, um, and I'm so lucky to have her always with me, is, cuando te caes, te levantas dos veces, or in English, when you fall, you get up twice. And the meaning behind the saying for me is that you get up stronger, that you're, commu co you're always transformed by hardships and the challenges that are in front of you. In essence, what my mom was teaching me was about continual transformation. Sorry, I get emotional when I think about my mom. She's still alive. She's, but um, there's just a very powerful relationship about what is, what is transmitted between us. I learned that her stories were about continual transformation that started before me with my grandmother and other women and that will continue after me. So I thought about how do these stories, uh, how do these stories impact me as a Latina woman and a professor of bilingual education? First, that these stories are not only important to my professional trajectory, but as an intellectual endeavor and not as a cultural curio, not as like, oh, this is really nice. And um, some of us were involved in a book study with Barbara, your work, and uh, and we read Jenny Moraga as well. And we talked about theories of the flesh and that these personal stories are not just things that are uh, exist on the intellectual level, but really exist in our bodies. Um, so, I also think about our students, and so many, for so many of them, walking across the door of school means leaving all these stories behind, devaluing the languages that they have, the experiences they have, because they might not be appropriate for school, or they might not feel that these are the stories that are valued in school, <coughs> or you know whether that school is K through 12 or higher ed. The mismatch between home literacies and school literacies have often been seen as a liability. And we know this very well, that children who don't go into school speaking English or knowing the alphabet are thought of already being blind, rather than as an opportunity for teachers to think about what counts as literacy. So all of these experiences help me reflect on thinking about how power circulates through literacy pedagogies. And specifically, because of my academic upbringing, because you know I went to public school in New York City that went to private schools, and I had an academic upbringing that really valued rigid notions of literacy. Writing papers in specific ways, presenting in specific ways. So how do we as individuals counteract that? My teaching journey has been centered around the question of how do we make connections between students emerging literacies and their futures as teachers. And what does this mean in the School of Education? First, I really believe that we need to embrace students' history, sensibilities, habits, and push against strong external demands to only uphold traditional literacies. And some of the examples of how that happens, and I see some of my former students here, is each year my students do textual lineages or timelines of texts that have been instrumental to their development as literate people. These include memories of grandparents, TV shows, songs, memories of childhood and languages other than English. And we get to know each other. I see Erica. <laughs> we get to know each other as literate people and to claim the literacies that are often not claimed in schools. Experiences like these are critical for our college students while they're here. Um, and the idea is that our lives are our texts, and I want that students to come away with that. They also, I, I believe, need to understand what does this mean for their life as teachers when they're in school. 
and that it's not about providing one or two experiences like this, but making sure that their experiences are always at the center, whether it means engaging in traditional texts or newer literacy. Um, so for me, you know, in, in terms of thinking about liberating pedagogy, it really starts with stories. It is about the dynamic nature of stories and how they change. Um, I believe, and I'm speaking about preparing teachers, is not a just about ensuring that they can deliver instruction because, you know, that can happen. You can learn that very easily any other place. But that our Brooklyn College students leave with an awareness and agency that they can meet challenges that they encounter within the field of creativity and awareness. Thank you so much, Laura, um, and thank you to all of the panelists. Um, so many powerful thoughts about teaching and learning and liberatory education. So we would like to open up the floor for thoughts, questions, and discussion. Hi. I just, I just, it's just a comment. I just, you want to use the mic? Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> it's just a comment. And if you want to identify sorry, yourself. I'm, yes, sorry. Right. <laughs> I'm Hi. Nancy. I'm a professor of history. I study medieval history. Um, but I just overwhelmed. I've been, I've been a student at lots of institutions. I'm just overwhelmed by how much I want you all to be my professor. Mm -hmm. And how I feel like I've never had such an honest, conversation about education. Mm -hmm. um, you're really, really, so that's all. Thank you. <laughs> uh, questions, comments? Yes, hi. Hi, my name is Mary Cruz Sanchez, and I'm a bilingual education major here at um, Brooklyn College. I just wanted to ask um, everyone what's the answer, but um, what keeps you going? Because I'm, uh, I'm an immigrant, and I'm um, I'm 26 years old, so it took me a while to realize what I want to do with my life. And, um, you know, I have this constant battle with myself on um, pushing, especially in a country that's fairly anti immigrant, with our politics going on. But I just wanted to know what keeps you guys going? <laughs> Students. <laughs> <laughs> I was um, going to say you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'll say specifically, um, I'm doing an assignment this um, semester with my th students in theory, and they have to write a letter to that 15-year-old self. Mm -hmm. So when I talked about, you know, me being more reflective, I'm challenging them to be reflective. And it's very uncomfortable because so much of their lives is go, 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 go. One class, knock it down, move on to the next 120 credits, hope for a job. What do you find out about yourself if you actually look at the last three, four years of your life and figure out what advice would you give to that 15-year-old? And I just didn't give them the assignment because I thought it was a cool activity, but it was also something that I would do myself because we're doing this together. And I learned about them, they learned about me, and it wasn't just comments on the paper, they got comments, but we met one-on-one -on -one and talked about what they wrote, so we processed it. And students were talking about, they have to be confident, they have to be confident. And I asked, why, why the need for such confidence? You know, what do you need confidence for? And they was like, life. So for me, I'm saying, okay, this is theory course. You begin theorizing from the standpoint that if you don't have confidence, life chews you up. Right? It's not about Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. They're mm -hmm. interesting, but what about your life that says, I'm going to use this reflection on a need for confidence then to explain everything around me, including Brooklyn College, but also my neighborhood and then the whole world. And then when we do that, theory becomes meaningful. And I have to be perceptive that if this is not a challenging activity in the most meaningful way, as uh, Lauren said, our our experiences are the text that is the most important. So 
I'm always gaining from experiences, interactions with students. So that's what keeps me going at the point at which, you know, I start teaching the class the same way over and over again or getting comfortable. I'm less inspired and I have to find a different job. Thank you. Um, Marie Cruz, first, I'm so glad you're a bilingual childhood major. That's wonderful. <laughs> I, I think it's a beautiful, rewarding career. Uh, we have several bilingual uh, teachers here. You know, today, uh, at, during class, I asked my students, tell me some thoughts about field work. And one student said, you know, I went into the auditorium to pick up uh, the class and the kids came and hugged me and then we danced a little. And I said, that is the heart of teaching. It's about, I mean, Michael, Michael was a former teacher. We taught together. Yes, you're teaching social studies, you're teaching math, you're doing, but to develop these relationships with your students makes possible that you're able to teach kids science. <laughs> which is important. And I think it's that nourishment to your soul that keeps you going. Yes. Hi. Do you want to talk more? Oh. Why don't you go ahead and then I'll say something. No, please go ahead. Um, I, I'll just elaborate a little bit on the student part. So I agree, but also it's a purely selfish reason for me because I feel like I'm still a student, I'm still learning, you know, it doesn't end. There are times um, when I feel hopeless and then, and then when I'm in a classroom, I see other students and I see myself, you know, I mean, I, it's hard to, to quantify that, except that I feel like I'm looking at a mirror. I'm looking at a version of myself uh, from years ago or from the future, like depending on who the student is, because sometimes their hope their confusion it's very it's very um infectious you know and then i have to find the the answer in the interaction between me and the classroom and then the student you know and and sometimes that happens in an individual level you know so for me um when I teach, I do feel like, because I ask myself this all the time, especially because I'm an adjunct, you know, I don't know if everybody knows what that means, but that means I'm a part-timer. <clears throat> I can be let go at will if, the depart if my department says, we don't have the budget for you. So every semester I come in with that knowledge. Uh, that's why I'm still a college assistant at the scholarship office. If you've ever written a letter to the scholarship office, I have probably seen and answered it. So, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, I ask myself this question frequently, why do I teach when, if in terms of reward, you know, financially, I, I don't get that. But then what I get out of it is this joy in that interaction that I have healed part of myself that hurt when I was a student, because I almost quit school. We have about uh, five minutes. Yes, please. Uh, uh, hi, my name is Cardo Larrington. I am a film major student here. Um, so for credit, I was born a bilingual, for bilingual child, so I'm taking a bilingual course um, to finish my graduation. Um, I grew up as a bilingual child. I grew up in a very um, political family. Uh, my family, we are a student. Um, from uh, the 70s, and I always grew up with a family that was very, like, outgoing. I remember my grandfather started a hunger strike to get a high school in uh, Little Village, Mondo, in Little Village, uh, in Chicago. And most recently, uh, the family were very connected to Chile, and we had an event where a bunch of high schoolers who started the revolution in Chile in 2019 came, and they were talking, and there was... The intent was to have like a community feel between high schoolers in Chile and some of the students here in New York. And there were some uh, some teachers that my uncle was connected with who were teachers here in Harlem. And in particular, there was a lot of problems they were talking about, institutional problems that the DOE was purposely forcing them. And not, like we're talking about access, um, she has been petitioning for about a month 
just to get there for the MTA, just to get all the students to be able to go to that event. Um, and there were a lot of other problems that they were talking about, um, like physical abuse that the students are dealing with in those schools. And there is zero accountability at all at an institutional level. So I guess this is more of an open-ended question, but in my mind, with my background, I instantly think organize, get a student movement, strike, get something going, get your local media on. But I was trained that way, like talking with my grandma. <laughs> ever since I was, like, ever since I learned to speak, I would go to my mom and say, Mom, fall. And I'd go to my dad and say, Hey, loca. <laughs> um, that was just kind of the way my parents never really allowed me to not fit. The biggest criticism I would ever say is, Why are you not? What is your mental process going to? And my question is, I guess the biggest challenge for me when I go to an institutional form of education is that a lot of other students that are my that I am in class with, they do not have the same kind of understanding of that context that they are surrounded. Not that it's their problem, but it's for those students who may not understand the impact that they're living in at that point, what kind of circles or kind of social engagement would you recommend that we start as like just kind of creating that open space? Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> I would like to respond to that. Please. Uh, when the first uh, person asked about how do you keep going, I see these two questions as connected in my mind. Uh, when you asked that question, I immediately thought of what you said, which is you organize. You know, you look at the, whatever the problem is, and of course we always know that very easily because we suffer from the problems that uh, systemic exploitation and oppressions cause. So I wasn't thinking about how do you keep going as a teacher because I haven't taught for so long. It's not my primary identity in my mind at this point, but I did want to talk about it here. And all I could think was, well, the way you keep going is because you're in struggle with other people who are concerned about the same thing. And you find uh, people who believe and have that vision that you have. You can't do it by yourself. As I said earlier today in another of our works, uh, of our, our conversations, you can't do social justice as an individual by yourself. There's no way to achieve, a, a, just achieve social, economic, racial, political, gender, et cetera, justice. But let's just say justice. You can't do it by yourself because it's not uh, susceptible to any individual interventions. So, you know, being a child of the 1960s and being uh, a person of African heritage living in the United States, I saw it for myself that uh, people coming together who were considered to be absolutely of no value, and that would be people of African heritage in the Jim Crow uh, era uh, and before, and actually transformed some things in the United States around the most extreme examples of uh, r racial exploitation and uh, segregation and oppression. Um, you talked about how, uh, you know, that's your perspective because of how you were raised. And we're in a situation now, it's a crisis, it's interesting that it hasn't come up this afternoon, that we're in a crisis in the United States about what people are allowed to teach what's valuable to teach, who's supposed to be comfortable in classrooms, and who's supposed to be protected in classrooms so they never have to hear about the truth uh, of the country in which they indeed dwell. That's what the right wing is about. You know, they don't care about children of color, uh, working class kids, poor kids, uh, definitely don't care about trans kids. It's the very idea that a whole segment of us, the stu of students and young people in this country are under attack from adults, uh, and everybody seems to be fine with that except for those of us who feel the attack. But the thing is that um, th they only care about a certain segment of kids not being upset in a classroom, and that's white, privileged children uh, you know, please don't tell them about, you know, settler colonialism, <laughs> white supremacy, you know, uh, and, you know, like genocide, 
et cetera. No, they can't handle that. Now, nobody cared about that, you know, when I was getting my education. It's like, who cares? We don't care about you. That poem about the, the white man's burden, I read that damn poem, you know, because I've read all, the, as I said, I've read all the British, you know, and all the, all the Americans, you know, horrifying, horrifying. Um, but we're at a really a break point. Anybody who's actively involved involved in anything called education at this uh, historical moment, we have our work cut out for us. And I think that there's a combination of creating situations in which we are able to function and keep faith with each other because we're not dwelling every 20, 24 hours a day, seven days a week in a state of misery. And then also that we realize that we have rights and that we have a right to the quality of education as well as the quality of life that we all deserve. But that's how I see things. I always think the solution is a struggle and also, if it doesn't exist, make it. If there was no such thing as black women's studies, then do the damn book, get the book out, and then people have to grapple with that. People would laugh at me when I talked about black women's studies. Black women would laugh at me or question me. There's no such thing as black women's studies, they would say. I said, I, I know, I know, but the thing is we can create it, you know. So that's kind of my ornery attitude. <laughs> Good questions. And I have to say I loved this panel. Yeah. I love being on this panel. So this is this is a wonderful place um, to wrap up, even though I know we all wish we had more time. <laughs> I wish you all had more time even to present. Um, I'd like to do two things as we're wrapping up. First, I'd like to remind you that um, tomorrow there are two Hess events. Um, there's one at 11 o'clock in the morning. It's called Working for Liberation and Having a Damn Good Time. Um, then there's the Robert L. Hess Memorial Lecture. Um, Barbara, I believe your talk is called uh, What I Believe. It is. Is that right? <laughs> it is. <laughs> that will be at the um, Claire Tau Theater, Whitman Hall, uh, tomorrow at 5 p.m. Um, and before we wrap up, I'd love to know, um, students in the audience, raise your hand if you plan to become a teacher, if you're thinking of becoming a teacher. <laughs> Again, just thank you all so much. What a wonderful, really powerful panel. Uh, we have so much food for thought. We have so much work to do. Um, so thank you. Oh, you're so very welcome. I know you're like, you're on, on like a, 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 a,